So just to give you a little bit of overview of where we are going to go for today's class. First, we're gonna go look at brief history of child development, right? How is it that we even began studying children? Who started uh, evaluating children in a laboratory setting? Then we're gonna go over the classical theories. So theories that really laid the foundation um, for how we understand child development. And then we're going to also uh, think about some of the contemporary theories, meaning that theories that are very relevant today. And then there was a video that I posted on uh, Canvas on Tuesday for you to watch, which were the themes of child development. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, given that there's the video that are there already. But um, we will quickly review them and give you an opportunity to ask any questions if you have any questions. So just a little uh, history overview. Um, we didn't always think that children or infants or babies were worth, worth studying. Um, children were sometimes seen as just commodities. People would have children so that they could be free labor. Uh, children were expected in some places, families to take care of themselves after seven years of age. And they were just expected to work in the field. There was no... Uh, education, formal education in place. Um, and people didn't really know what to think of children, right? We knew that they were different, clearly. They behaved differently. Their way of thinking was differently. But no one really understood how they were different, why they were different, or what allowed for the changes that occurred throughout development to occur. So um, if you see here, there's a, a art. What do you all see in this image? What are some things that you notice? And by the way, uh, using the chat function is completely welcome. So if you want to participate via chat, totally fine. Yeah, it's a, uh, so Lily said it's a downscaled adult. Yeah, so this is a painting of Madonna and child, which is like the Virgin, the Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. And if you zoom in or you really look at baby Jesus, he doesn't look like a baby. He just looks like a miniature adult, which is a little bit creepy, right? But the reason why I wanted to show you this image is because you can really see how children were kind of viewed at this time, right? They weren't necessarily understood. They were just kind of see as like, seen as like miniature versions of humans. Yeah, they act weird. They think weird, but not much else was known until a couple of uh, gentlemen started talking about and thinking about children or how humans come to this earth. So John Locke, is a very well-known philosopher um, who emphasized the idea that children came into this world as a blank slate, meaning that genetics or predispositions were not relevant. They didn't have any preconceived expectations. Children just come into this world not knowing anything. On the other hand, Jean-Jacques Rousseau also said, um, yeah, children maybe don't have a, not a lot of knowledge, but they're actually born good. And it's up to society to ensure that they remain good moral citizens. So based on these philosophers, um, religious organizations actually begin to uh, expect children to come to schools or organizations to ensure that they were taught the right way, that they were taught morals, that they were taught, you know, work ethic. And so both philosophers and religious organizations were kind of the ones that began to really value children and ensure that they were getting an appropriate education. So beyond these uh, important uh, characters, right, within the child development field, we also have uh, three important uh, characters that kind of started the field, the research field of child development. Uh, so Charles Darwin, I'm sure many of you have heard about him, um, was very interested in observing development across organisms. So he uh, liked to document uh, prenatal development and then infant behavior across species, including his own child. 
So he kind of was, uh, is thought to be the first to really like start documenting this period of development, childhood. And then inspired by Charles Darwin's observation, Stanley G. Hall decided that it was really important to establish some sort of standard for development. What that means is that he believed it was important to start writing down important metrics across development. How much should a child weigh at two years of age versus five? How tall should they be? Uh, when should they start walking? So he was kind of the first that started um, more like observational or descriptive studies in children. However, it wasn't until James Mark Baldwin started to systematically study infants and children in the laboratory setting using experiments, right? Not just documenting what children do, but actually manipulating different things to really study behavior across different contexts and conditions. But the field of child development research really took off. And James Mark Baldwin's research uh, involved uh, observing uh, reaching behavior in infants across different contexts using you know, different objects, colors, distance. And that is why that was thought to be the first experimental uh, study that is documented with children because he manipulated the different objects that were presented to children as well as the, you know, there was different conditions. So now we kind of know uh, the important figures that laid the ground uh, for child development, right? The field of child development. And from then on, researchers started to be really intrigued about how or why development happened. So um, many people started to come up with theories of child development, meaning that they tried to have an account for how emotion, reasoning, attachment, personality, identity, morality, relationships develop throughout the lifespan. And although there were many theories, they broadly fall into a couple of categories. And these include the psychoanalytic theories, the learning theories, the social cultural theories, attachment theories, and cognitive theories. And we will go through each of these different categories one by one. All right, so the first is a psychoanalytic theories. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Freud. Hopefully everyone, right? Um, he's a very popular uh, figure in psychology because he's thought to be the father of clinical psychology. He was uh, very interested in treating clinical patients um, and trying to explain uh, atypical behavior. Now, we now know that a lot of his theories were wrong. Um, and one of the reasons why they were wrong is because you couldn't really test them. Um, and when we go over, of course, uh, research methods and child development, we will dive deeper into that idea. But nonetheless, uh, Sigmund Freud was a big um, person in the field of child development. His theory, which is called the psychosexual development theory, proposed that behavior was motivated by internal unconscious drives. Um, specifically, uh, Freud uh, stated that we had three different uh, kind of like identities within us that were always in conflict. So the first is the id. And the id is something you are born with. It is this very selfish identity or force within you that's always trying to seek out pleasure. Then we have the opposite of that, which is the superego. And the superego actually didn't emerge or become evident in development till maybe after six months. The superego is kind of like your moral compass. It's trying to really consider how your actions might affect others and trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. 
And then the ego is the one that's kind of negotiating between the id and the superego, right? The ego wants the id to get the pleasure or get the things that it wants, but it also considers the superego. It considers that there are times when it is inappropriate to, to go after what you want. So it kind of tries to negotiate between the two. And all of these different forces, so to speak, that are within you work at different levels, right? There's the conscious level, which is right now you're consciously aware that you're taking notes or listening to me talk. There's the pre-conscious, which could be brought up uh, to consciousness if you focus on it. So maybe you weren't aware that there's maybe a leaf blower outside, but if you were to start paying attention to that, it could come to your conscious awareness. And then there's the unconscious, which Freud said was responsible for a lot of our behavior. And he thought that it was clinicians' um, job to kind of tap into the unconscious to explain people's behavior. Again, his theories have not been able to be empirically tested. But something that is important about Freud is that he did highlight the fact that what happens in childhood does affect behavior and cognition throughout development and into adulthood. So a student of Freud um, didn't really love his Freud's theory, and he decided to come up with his own, okay? And this guy was Eric Erickson. Eric Erickson came up with a psychosocial development theory. And his main proposition was that development wasn't driven primarily by the id and the ego and the superego. Um, he, he thought that the ego existed and that actually that was a big force, but what really drove development was the fact that throughout stages of development, throughout a child's growing up, there were particular conflicts that the child needed to resolve. So he came up with eight different stages of psychosocial development. And in each stage, the child had to resolve a conflict. So for example, um, for 18 to three years of age, when you're a toddler, uh, Erickson proposed that children needed to gain some sort of autonomy. So for example, it's important that at this age, children figure out how to be potty trained because that gave them a sense of autonomy. And if children did not gain some sense of autonomy, then their development would be stunted. So one common thread about Freud's theory and Erickson's theory is that they both proposed that children needed to resolve some sort of conflict, whether it's resolving the id and the superego's desires or whether it's resolving autonomy versus shame and doubt, that they needed to go through these stages in order. And if they didn't, then that's when things go awry and development gets stunted. All right, so I don't know if you had been explained how, why there are so many theories and stuff like that, but like psychology is actually super juicy, okay? Because it's people trying to fight back theories that they think make no sense, okay? So first these psychoanalytic theories were like, wow, that's really interesting. And then people started saying like, mm, I don't know about that, okay? We have John Watson and Aubrey Bandura that thought that the psychoanalytic theory was BS. Why? Because it couldn't be tested. The field of psychology, the more that went on, became more and more rigorous, right? And making sure that the theories were testable, that we could design really good experiments or studies to provide support for the theories that were in play. And so Albert Bandura, you know, hearing these psychoanalytic theories were like, um, not so fast there, bro. Yeah, it's cool and all that you think that the unconscious like has effect on development, but prove it. And if you can't, then we need to think about something else. And he was the one that kind of pushed behaviorism to the forefront of child development. Does anyone remember what behaviorism is from your intro to psychology class? So behaviorists are very passionate about studying behavior systematically, right? Things that you can see in order to understand what's going on psychologically. And not only that, at the extreme of behaviorism are people like John Watson who believe that 
the environment is completely responsible for your psychological growth. So one of his famous quotes, which is very arrogant, is give me a handful of infants, well-formed in my own specified world to bring them up in. And I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant, chief, and yes, even beggar man and thief. So what this quote really exemplifies is this idea that he didn't think nature really mattered. He didn't think predispositions, genetics, anything like that mattered in terms of how you developed or who you ended up being. He placed all of his chips on nature or nurture, that it was the environment that was going to determine who you became and how you developed. And one of the reasons why he was so cocky was because he ran this really famous study called the Little Albert Experiment. And again, in Intro to Psych, you would have heard this in the context of um, classical conditioning, right? When you take one stimulus and you pair it with another to shape behavior. So in the Little Albert Experiment, this poor, poor, innocent little baby was brought into the lab. And what Watson wanted to test is whether he could uh, induce fear in a baby. And what he did is he basically presented little Albert with a rubber rat or a rubber rabbit, like cute little fake animals that the baby would actually like. But what he started doing is he started pairing the presentation of these furry animals with a really big loud sound, which would of course startle the baby and the baby would begin to cry at the startling noise. And with repetition, the baby began to pair or associate the presentation of this furry creature to a loud sound. So then the baby started being afraid of any furry fake creature that it came across. And because of this, he said, see, I was able to manipulate and induce fear in this baby. If I had never manipulated his environment, he wouldn't be afraid of these random furry creatures. But look, I was able to do that. So that was one experiment that really supported uh, his theory of, you know, learning that it is the environment that shapes behavior and shapes development. Albert Bandura, on the other hand, was maybe a little more humble than John Watson. He was like, yeah, I do agree that the environment has an effect, but we're giving too little credit to the child themselves. He actually believed that, yeah, children learn through the environment and can be shaped um, in the environment, but you also have to understand that the way that they interpret events, their memory, their thinking, their emotions, all of that's going to interact with the environment. So his social learning theory uh, emphasized the fact that children can learn, change, and develop by observing their environment and interpreting what they see in their environment. So of course, John Watson and Albert Bandura do emphasize learning and explaining child development. Albert Bandura, unlike John Watson, really emphasized cognition, right? Cognition, of course, is learning, remembering, and thinking. And so we can thank Albert Bandura and to social learning theory, because he kind of was the one that began to bridge behaviorism with cognition. So of course, if we talk about theories, there has to be some sort of support for it, um, at least current theories. So the study that he provided, one of the studies that he provided to provide support for this social learning theory was the Bobo study. In the Bobo study, Albert Bandura brought in children. Half of them were put in a condition where they would watch an adult in a video be very aggressive towards this blow up doll, punch it, kick it, things like that. In another condition, children just watch the adult interact with the doll in a non aggressive way. And then the dependent variable across these two conditions was to see um, how the child would interact with the Bobo doll when they got the opportunity to do so. Meaning if the child 
observes an adult be aggressive towards this blow up doll? Will children be more likely to also act in an aggressive way compared to if they hadn't seen an adult? act in an aggressive way towards this doll. So I'm going to show you a video of that might of what that might look like. So here's the video that the child's half of the children Threw will look down at. And beat it. And then this is what the experimenters observed in children that were in this condition. So as you see, children indeed that saw the video of the adults being very aggressive were also more likely to be aggressive towards the Bobo doll compared to the children that did not witness this aggression being perpetrated by an adult. It was once widely believed that seeing others vent aggression would drain the viewer's aggressive drive. As you can see, exposure to aggressive modeling is hardly cathartic. All right, so before Albert Bandura came along, someone very famous who started pushing back on behaviorism came about. And his name was Jean Piaget. So remember, this is like a soap opera, okay? It's like the behaviorist against the psychoanalyst and then the cognitivist against the behaviorist. Everyone's trying to be like, you're wrong and I'm right and trying to put, push forth their ideas of how development happens. So Jean Piaget wanted to push back against behaviorism. Uh, people that came up with cognitive theories to explain human behavior were very much against the idea that all of psychology could be explained in terms of the environment, right? That there was memory, there was emotion, there were thinking patterns, all of this stuff is going to interact in order to produce behavior in psychology. So Jean Biaget um, actually started studying his own children in order to understand development a little bit better. And he, um, we're going to dive into his theory later in the course, but in general, his theory proposed that children are constructivists, that children are very active in their learning, that they're looking around the world and trying to understand what is happening, right? They're creating ideas of why the world works a particular way. And then based on data they acquire, they update their understanding of how the world works. So this is of course pushing back on behaviorism in Jot Watson, because he's saying that children aren't at the mercy of their environment. They're not just passive, waiting around for someone to shape their behavior. They're actually active. They're trying to understand and learn about themselves in the world. And then in addition, um, he also proposed that learning is discontinuous, meaning that he believed that a child at four years of age thought completely different than a child at seven years of age. And again, we're going to go more over that later on. But the reason why I wanted to highlight this as well is because it fits with the theme, right, of child development and trying to understand studies, whether something's continuous versus discontinuous. Discontinuous meaning there's stages, qualitatively different stages that children go through, humans go through in their way of thinking and acting versus quantitatively different, meaning that children uh, just get better at something as opposed to their way of thinking is completely different. All right, next in the drama of theories is the social cultural, oops, people. And what the social cultural people pushed back on was the fact that all these other theories were too zoomed in. And they basically said, look, I appreciate your theories, but it seems like you're missing the forest for the trees. You're not getting a full picture of development by just looking at behavior or looking at cognitive processes. In fact, you need to look further out. The interaction between the child and the caregiver, the, 
the school system, right? The culture, how is that affecting child development? So two proponents of that were Lef Bogotsky and Bromfenbrenner. So the social cultural theories of development, um, again, wanted to emphasize the role of social interactions and the larger context in which the child found themselves in. Lef Vygotsky came up with the social development theory and he really wanted to emphasize the fact that children learn through interpersonal experiences. So one of his quotes that describes this theory states, every function in the child's cultural development appears twice, first on the social level and later on the individual level, first between people and then inside the child. Meaning that again, children are first learning by social interaction and then they internalize that themselves. So something that he's very well known for is um, the zone of proximal development. The zone of proximal development is the space between what the child is not able to do and what the child will be able to do. So the zone of proximal development, if you consider this concentric circle is this middle part. So let me give you an example. Let's say that um, a child's not able to tie their own shoes. They're at what they cannot do, but then eventually they will be able to tie their shoe. So in the zone of proximal development, the parent is scaffolding, right? It's helping the child to learn how to tie their shoes by, for example, teaching them the bunny song. All right, moving on. Um, to Yuri Bronfrenbremer. Uh, it's Bronfrenbremer. Um, and his ecological theory. So, like Vygotsky, he really thought that we needed to zoom out, you know, beyond just a child's own behavior and cognition. But he like zoomed out like a lot, okay? In addition to just emphasizing the role of social interactions, Bronfenbrenner actually focused on how culture, society, child's context would affect child development. So his model, his ecological systems theory or model emphasized that all of these different levels would affect children's development. So let me give you an example of how this might look like. Let's say, um, let's look at, for example, the different policies or values that are in place across societies in terms of education. Is education required? If so, when does formal education start? If it is required, is education free? If education is not free, that means that parents either have to work or they're gonna be really stressed out economically. And if they have to work, how does that time away from the child or how is the stress from working going to affect the relationship between the parent and the child? And if parents are so busy working that maybe they don't have time to spend with their child, how does that affect the child's development? So as you see, something as broad as like education policy, how that can have trickle down effects and go down all of these different levels to affect child development. And that is Yuri, what Yuri Bronfenbrenner wanted to highlight. And what's really cool about Bronfenbrenner is that he not only came up with this theory and emphasized its importance, he actually did something with it. So he started the Head Start program, which is a program in the United States that offers free preschool to individuals who um, don't have the means to afford preschool. Okay, and then the last thing we're going to talk about is attachment. So attachment theory, which one of the biggest proponents of this theory was John Bowlby, really wanted to emphasize the role that the caregiver had in children's development. So this is a little different than um, Lef Vygotsky theory, right? He emphasized the role of social interaction and scaffolding because he said any adult could do that. Teachers, 
parents, religious people, like anyone. Uh, John Bowlby, however, emphasized in particular in the caregiver. And in, and, in, and more specifically, he emphasized the role of the caregiver within the first year of life. He really thought that development is highly impacted by the quality of the relationship between the caregiver, in this case, they tended to study moms, and the child. And he said that if a child did not have a responsive, caring, and sensitive caregiver early on in development, that they would have a lot of developmental delays. Part or some evidence for this theory comes from children that came from the Romanian orphanage. So there was a period of time in Romania where the leader at the time wanted people to have a ton of children. So they were encouraged to have children and I think they also banned forms of birth control so that this would happen. But people, of course, didn't have the means to take care of all the children that they would have. So this created a big influx in orphanages at this time. And because there were so many children in these orphanages, there wasn't enough resources or people to take care of these children. So some of these babies were never touched or held other than when they were fed or their diapers were changed. They weren't talked to, they weren't cradled, they kind of were basically left alone. And so what happened is that some of these children began to be adopted out. Some of them were adopted out around six months and others were adopted out around two years of age or later. And what they found is that the children that were adopted within the first six months of being born had the best outcomes. They were able to form a very good, strong relationship with their adoptive parents. They had good social skills. Um, they didn't have any developmental delays. They looked like their other peers that weren't born in orphanages. But the children that were born after, or that were adopted after six months, and in particular children that weren't adopted until two years of age, suffered a lot of developmental delays. They weren't reaching milestones like their peers. They were not able to form good, strong relationships with their adoptive parents, and they just didn't thrive. So because of this, um, it really highlighted the role that caregiving, right? That bond between a child and their caregiver, how much that matters in terms of development. So just to summarize, because I know that we went over a lot of different stuff. Um, we have different categories in terms of theories that explain child development. Psychoanalytic theories, learning theories, cognitive theories, social culture and ecological theories, and attachment theories. And these theories try to emphasize what really matters in terms of what explains children's development. And as we talked about, there's different uh, ideas about what might account for this.